This is Sean Spicer, the Trump administration's first White House press secretary. On January 21st, 2017, he made a statement concerning how the press was reporting the size of the crowd at Trump's presidential inauguration. Photographs of the inaugural proceedings were intentionally framed in a way, in one particular tweet, to minimize the enormous support that had gathered on the National Mall. This was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration, period, both in person and around the globe. Except that it wasn't, at least not in person. Photos comparing Barack Obama's inauguration ceremony in 2009 compared to Donald Trump's in 2017 clearly showed a difference in crowd size. And I don't think that any reasonable person would have expected Trump's to be bigger. Because, let's face it, the inauguration of the first African-American president is a lot more of a must-see moment compared to the first billionaire businessman's inauguration. But Spicer using this moment to attack the press for their coverage of the crowd size was stupid. This moment largely set the tone for how the White House press corps would interact with Trump's press secretaries going forward. Two days later, during the first official press briefing, Jonathan Carl of ABC News posed the following question. And do you stand by your statement that, that was the most watched inaugural I think, address? In sure, time? it was the most watched inaugural. And I don't see any numbers that, that dispute that. When you add up attendance, viewership, uh, total audience in terms of tablets, phones, uh, on television, I'd love to see any information that proves, me, proves that otherwise. Do you, do, do you dispute that? Well, I, I don't want to get into to numbers. I, 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 well, I do. But Jonathan Carl didn't want to get into the numbers of how many people watched it on their phones and tablets. The only thing that he and his colleagues cared to talk about was that more people attended back in 2009 than they did in 2017 in the hopes that it would bother Trump. The press set a trap and the White House took the bait. And then something unprecedented happened. Is it your intention to always tell the truth from that podium? And will you pledge never to knowingly say something that is not factual? It is. Our intention is never to lie to you, Jonathan. Um, our job is to make sure that sometimes, and you're in the same boat. I mean, there are times when you guys tweet something out or write a story and you publish a correction. That doesn't mean that you were intentionally trying to deceive readers and the American people, does it? No, it does. In Jonathan Carl's new book, front row at the Trump show, he writes about how Sean Spicer had told others that I would never have asked such a question of a press secretary for a Democratic president. Here again, Sean was disagreeing with the facts. I had asked Josh Ernest a variation of the same question when he became Obama's press secretary. For some reason, John didn't write in his book what that variation was so that the reader could compare the two questions and make that judgment for themselves. So I guess we'll just have to take John at his word or we could just watch the clip. Is there, is there ever an excuse to be, to, to mislead the public? You know, if, if, there's a, if there's a security reason, if telling the full truth would jeopardize security, is, is, it, is there ever, from your perspective, somebody who every day briefs the public from that podium, uh, is, there, is it ever okay to say something that is misleading or not true if that is in effect, uh, t telling the truth or the full truth would actually jeopardize uh, security? So John's question to Press Secretary Josh Ernest was about protecting a security interest. John's question to Sean Spicer was directly questioning his integrity. Is it your intention to always tell the truth from that podium and will you pledge never to knowingly say something that is not factual? Do you see the difference? And I will point out that John Carl nor any of his colleagues ever asked Obama's press secretaries if they would pledge never to lie. Funny how that works. Anyway, Sean Spicer didn't last very long in the role and was replaced by Sarah Huckabee Sanders. During Sanders' second briefing, George Condon from the National Journal asked Sarah the following. Do you see any circumstances where it's appropriate to lie from the podium? Absolutely not. I don't think it's appropriate to lie from the podium or any other place. There wasn't a reason for Condon to be asking her that, as it was only Sarah's second briefing as press secretary and she hadn't said anything misleading or untruthful to trigger such a question. But I guess it's better than asking her to pledge never to lie, and it's definitely better than the following hit piece by CNN's Brian Stelter. Uh, what I've been noticing is a, a lack of answers. Let me show you what I mean. First, a lot of I don't knows from Sarah Huckabee Sanders. No, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm not sure. We don't know. I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware of any specific. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the specifics. I don't know. I'm not aware of that. 
Wow, either Sarah Huckabee Sanders doesn't have an answer to anything and she's really bad at her job, or Brian Stelter just took a bunch of her words and completely took them out of context. For example, let's take a look at Sarah Sanders talking about congressional Democrats. Watch down in the lower left where CNN took their clips. Certainly helping more Americans have more money that they worked hard to earn in their pocket. I don't know anybody that would want to be against that. I would love for uh, Democrats to want to help all Americans. I don't know why they would ever want to be against that. Sanders saying, I don't know anybody that would want to be against that is a statement and not a failure to answer a reporter's question. In the next clip, NBC's Haley Jackson asked Sanders about the Trump administration possibly ending the DACA program. Can you at least talk about the timeline for this for those folks who are wondering what their status is going to be here? Uh, again, I'm not going to get ahead of something and be presumptuous when a decision hasn't been made. I, we don't know when the final review is going to be completed, so it would be disingenuous for me to create a false timeline. Here Sanders was telling Haley Jackson that we don't know when the Department of Homeland Security would finish their review of DACA, so she couldn't give an answer to a decision that hadn't been made yet. So when Stelter says that there are a lack of answers, he is lying. Now, I'm not going to debunk every example from Stelter's montage, but I have provided a video link in the description showing the context of each clip that Stelter used and proving how his entire montage was garbage. I hope you check it out. With that said, Stelter is one of the most dishonest people in news, yet he has the audacity to name his show Reliable Sources. And with that, I don't recall Stelter ever making a similar hit piece on an Obama-era press secretary, but if he did, I think it would go something like this. My apologies in advance to Mark Dice. Uh, what I've been noticing is uh, a lack of answers. Let me show you what I mean. First, a lot of I don't knows from Josh Ernest. I'll be honest with you, I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know exactly the time frame. Well, I don't have any uh, anything to say. I don't know the process, so I don't know if I don't know all the details. Uh, I don't know, and I don't know, I don't know. 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 Look, I don't know. But I don't know. We don't know. We don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So I'm not really sure. I don't have any details. At this point, I don't have details. I don't know the exact status of that. Well, I have to admit that I don't know the details and I don't have any. I don't have any details. Now, let's watch Stelter back in 2014 tell Josh Ernest his opinion on how press briefings are supposed to be run. I remember your first briefing in June was described as testy, and I thought, wait, that's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> so in 2014, Stelter says that the press briefing is supposed to be testy, but cut to February 2018, and Stelter's attitude has clearly changed. Sanders can be combative. She can be dismissive. She said it was a racial slur. What is your response to that? I, I think that's a ridiculous response. Jonathan Carl was asking Sanders about this moment when President Trump was hosting members of the Navajo Code Talkers and made a joke about Senator Elizabeth Warren. And I just want to thank you because you're very, very special people. You were here long before any of us were here. Although we have a representative in Congress who they say was here a long time ago. They call her Pocahontas. <laughs> Classic Trump. He referred to Pocahontas being in the Senate. Why did he feel the need to say something that is offensive to many people while honoring the Navajo code talkers, these genuine American I think heroes. what most people find offensive is uh, Senator Warren lying about her heritage to advance her career. Now she Stephen said it was a Harris. racial slur. She said it was a racial slur. What is your response to that? I, I think that's a ridiculous response. And of course, Sanders is right on all counts. And for Stelter to call this exchange combative instead of testy shows his political bias. By now, she's been behind the podium longer than her predecessor, Sean Spicer, and with a long list of fibs to prove it. The On the subject of a very serious probe of Russian interference. That this is a witch hunt and a hoax. She is lying, critics say. Sarah's job as press secretary is to convey Trump's positions and opinion on things. And his opinion on the Mueller probe was that it was a witch hunt and a hoax. So how is it a fib or a lie? Anyway, by late 2018, Sanders' formal press briefings were a rarity. And it seems it was because of a directive from the president himself. In January 2019, President Trump tweeted, The reason Sarah Sanders does not go to the podium much anymore is that the press covers her so rudely and inaccurately. In particular, certain members of the press. You don't say. 
And quite frankly, you don't need these daily press briefings anyway. If a member of the press corps has a question, they can phone, email, or stop by the White House press office for an answer. All these press briefings do is provide TV time to reporters like April Ryan, who are less concerned with asking legitimate questions and more concerned with becoming part of the story. You said yourself you were blindsided. By I actually what you didn't said. use that term. Well, I said it, but you were blindsided from what you said. <laughs> well, for uh, with all due respect, you actually don't know much about me in terms of what I feel and what I don't. But she went straight to me to say something like, you know, you don't know me. You actually don't know much about me. In certain sectors of this nation, people understand what you don't know me means. It's very street, and it, it, it leads to a fight, a physical fight. All I know is that I'd pay top dollar to watch that bout. Has the president at any time thought about stepping down before or now? Uh, no, and I think that's an absolutely ridiculous question. No, it's not, it's not ridiculous. Ridiculous. I gave you it's two not questions, April. Really. We're moving on. Jordan, go ahead. It's not ridiculous. But that was one of the most absurd, asinine questions ever asked from the White House briefing room. But that just revealed the evidence of political bias, uh, that question. And you have a bunch of reporters in this briefing room. They're really liberal political commentators posing as reporters. That was Trump 2020 campaign spokesperson Kaylee McEnany, and clearly she gets it. Which is probably why she was hired as Trump's newest press secretary. And if you've been paying attention, you can see what's coming. Um, will you pledge never to lie to us from that podium? I will never lie to you. You have my word on that. I would not have been so gracious in answering Joe Colvin, who is definitely not an objective reporter, but Kaylee's answer was what it needed to be. I think it was a grave miscarriage of justice, what happened with Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Um, I, there's no need for me to bring up some of the salacious, awful, and verifiably false allegations that were made against Justice Kavanaugh. And that's when the hit pieces started. Vox's Aaron Rupar wrote that McEnany's statement about the Kavanaugh allegations was a lie. Then Rupar completely misquoted McEnany. Let me play you what she said versus what Rupar wrote. There's no need for me to bring up some of the salacious, awful, and verifiably false allegations that were made against Justice Kavanaugh. By misquoting her, Aaron Rupar made it look like that she was saying that all of the allegations were verifiably false, when in reality, McEnany said some. And that some would include the allegation by Judy Monroe Layton, who admitted that the claims she made in a letter to Congress were fabricated and that she wrote the letter as a ploy to get attention. So yes, Aaron Rupar of Vox, some of those allegations were verifiably false. Later, CNN released this video titled, White House Press Secretary Didn't Support Candidate Trump at First. Kaylee, how sick of polls are people in New Hampshire right now? <laughs> uh, probably very sick, especially when they see that Donald Trump is number two and doesn't deserve to be there. Okay, Look, well, I, what do you think of the, uh, the, the Trump excitement? What do you chalk that up? I appreciate his boldness, and I think some of his rhetoric got the base excited, but it is not welcome rhetoric. Look, the GOP doesn't need to be turning away voters and isolating them. We need to be bringing them into the tent. Mm. Donald Trump is the last person who's going to do that. that music choice, so dramatic. But the fact is that a lot of Republicans felt the same way, but eventually Trump won them over, including Kaylee. But by pointing this out, CNN is trying to question her integrity and create division, but <laughs> nice try, CNN. And when Kaylee became the press secretary in April, the Washington Post made a video featuring this clip from an interview on Fox Business. Looking at the coronavirus and the president saying, you know, look, we're not gonna take people in from China right now. I mean, isn't it just a matter of protecting us, our national security really being at stake? And he's sort of the last line of defense there. Or first That's line, right. I should say. Absolutely, this president will always put America first. He will always protect American citizens. We will not see diseases like the coronavirus come here. We will not see terrorism come here. And isn't that refreshing when contrasting it with the awful presidency of President Obama? Kaylee was asked about travel restrictions and stated the intent of those restrictions. On that day, the U.S. had 53 reported cases, so it's not like that she was denying that there weren't any cases here. But during McEnany's second press briefing on May 6th, she was asked about this by Reuters reporter Jeff Mason, who should worry less about gotcha questions and more about buying a suit that fits properly. Jeff. Um, Kaylee, in a previous life, before you were press secretary, you worked for the campaign, mm -hmm. and you made a comment, I believe on Fox, in which you said President Trump will not allow the coronavirus to come to this country. 
Given what has happened since then, obviously, would you like to take that back? Even if Kaylee was wrong, and she wasn't, who cares? When she said it, she was a private citizen working on Trump's campaign. If I were Jeff Mason, I'd be less concerned with Kaylee getting something wrong and more concerned about government officials and a World Health Organization getting it wrong, but that's just me. Given what has happened since then, obviously, would you like to take that back? Well, first let me note, I was asked a question um, on Fox Business about the president's travel restrictions. I noted what was the intent behind those travel restrictions, which is we will not see the coronavirus come here. We will not see terrorism come here, referring to an earlier set of travel restrictions. I guess I would turn the question back on the media and ask similar questions. Does Vox want to take back that they proclaim that the coronavirus would not be a deadly pandemic? Does the Washington Post want to take back that they told Americans to get a grip, the flu is bigger than the coronavirus? Does the Washington Post likewise want to take back that our brains are causing us to exaggerate the threat of the coronavirus? Does the New York Times want to take back that fear of the virus may be spreading faster than the virus itself? Does NPR want to take back that the flu was a much bigger threat than the coronavirus? And finally, once again, the Washington Post, would they like to take back that the government should not respond aggressively to the coronavirus? I'll leave you with those questions and maybe you'll have some answers in a few days. Of course she was prepared for that, because a month earlier, Andrew Kaczynski of CNN's K-File called her out on Twitter, Kaylee responded, and eventually Kaczynski had to admit that her statement was not a denial that the coronavirus was here. And had Jeff Mason done his research, you know, like a real journalist, he would have known all of this had already been litigated on Twitter, and he and the media in general wouldn't have gotten wrecked on national television. But the question's out to you, Secretary McKinney. Anyway, thanks for watching, sharing, and hitting that like button. Follow me on Twitter for updates, and be sure that you're still subscribed to the channel, and hopefully, I'll see you next time.